Welcome in to another new AMP podcast. I'm your host, Ben DuBose, and I'm the news editor for the AMP publications team. Today, we've got a panel discussion for you regarding a subject that should be important to everyone within the Association for Materials Protection and Performance, and that's the future of workforce development within skilled trades. Joining us today are Alan Thomas, the current CEO of AMP, Rick Polanin, a past president of the American Welding Society, and Ricky Morgan, a past president of the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing. By bringing in leadership figures from three associations, our hope is to provide you with a fairly balanced perspective from multiple industries. So we're going to be discussing a number of topics in this panel, but before we get into the specifics, I want to let each of you introduce yourself and tell our audience about your careers a bit more, because I know each of you have not only association experience, but experience out in the field and the industry as well. So, Alan, we can start with you. Thanks uh, for having me, Ben, and uh, thanks to our guests for joining. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you and, and really taking it farther. I'm new to AMP, as a lot of the listeners might know. I've been in the seat now for, I believe, eight months, a little over eight months. And uh, it's been a great eight months. I've seen a lot of our members around the world, uh, listened to a lot of their stories and uh, working with staff and boards to meet needs at a, at a greater level. Um, from a personal background, I've spent uh, about 15 years in association management uh, at the executive level, and I also spent about 15 years in the private sector working in and out of some private equity deals and and uh, owned and operated my own company for a while in the coatings and metal finishing space. I uh, did that for seven years uh, with a, a, a group of business partners um, and got uh, got to understand metal finishing and coatings and plating a lot more than I ever thought I would uh, <laughs> have the experience to, to know that. So I, I definitely have had my uh, time understanding, you know, what both of our guests and their organizations do with non-destructive testing and welding inspection. And there's so much overlap between our three organizations um, and, and, and our, our members are meeting in the field on a daily basis. Um, and when I ran that business, you know, I was deeply ingrained and involved with the, all the inspection teams from their respective groups as well. So um, just a little bit about me. So I've kind of been around the block a bit, uh, happy to be in the seat and serving and, and trying to grow our member base and and uh, deliver greater value to them and, and, and to both of our guest organizations as well. Rick, how about you? Thanks, Ben. You mentioned that I was the 2022 president of the American Welding Society. Of course, that's a volunteer job. So my real job is to be professor and chair of manufacturing engineering technology and welding engineering technology at a college in central Illinois. But in addition, I am the uh, co-principal investigator for the National Center for Welding Education and Training. It's a National Science Foundation funded organization that is devoted to workforce development, especially in welding and non-destructive testing. And I work as a welding engineer to do inspection and welding process and forensic evaluation of welds throughout uh, central Illinois. Um, I'm the chair of the American Welding Society Education and Training Committee. And so we are all very uh, interested in workforce development. Um, at all levels within the American Welding Society, and certainly my career has been devoted to workforce development throughout the entire 35 or plus years that I've been teaching. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We're thrilled to have you. Ricky, we'll wind down the introductions with you. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you for having us. <laughs> and I am really glad that all three of our societies are are talking about this. I think it affects us all. And I've had the good fortune of actually being a member of AWS and AST, and I've hired several NACE uh, pre predecessor to AM, AMP uh, inspectors in the past. So it's, I think it's really great that we're all working together towards this common goal. But I started back in 1987. I, I got out of the Army and uh, wanted to figure out some other things to do. So I went to the College of Oceaneering, still had some an eye on some adventure, but I also took some non-destructive testing as part of my background. And that found, I found NDT to be something I, I really enjoyed more than, uh, but I ended up doing a diving career for quite a while. And then um, working in NDT, working mostly oil and gas primarily and marine. 
Um, after the 94 earthquake, I got heavily involved in the structural steel and welding, um, carried several uh, ICBO, ICC certs, and probably had certifications in probably six different jurisdictions for structural steel welding and bolting. Became heavily involved with ASNT through the 90s, uh, eventually came on the board of directors, became a president 2011-2012, uh, and have been involved with um, workforce development most of my career, either find, trying to find my own workforce or helping other people find people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently on the workforce development committee for ASNT. Um, I'm on the board of directors currently, also on the ultra science committee and the technician development committee. And um, I think that kind of speaks to where my passions lie is um, trying to get people involved with it. NDT, I always thought it was a the great accidental profession. Absolutely. Ricky, we'll start with you uh, for this initial topic. I'm going to invert the order somewhat so it's a little less predictable to our listeners, hopefully keep people on their toes. A yeah. As far as workforce development, what's your perception on its current state within your industry? And what are some initiatives or strategies that you found effective in helping to promote workforce growth? Um, I think um, the biggest thing is, we, is, is our outreach is primarily our biggest thing is that we need to do more better do better outreach to reach the current generations that are coming into the workforce uh, i think we were pretty much used to how we used to do it for other people in our previous generations so um they're looking to be involved right away um some people are, are not used to um paying dues like we're, we're used to growing up and so um, getting them involved in the in the decision processes and the is very important but what we're trying to do is lay out roadmaps for career success um, within the NDT field. And then we're also doing outreach to teachers and education. And now we're also working on apprenticeship programs, um, which we have not been very active in those in the past. But um, we're a little behind the curve right now, but we're I think we're catch, catch, catching stride. Rick, we'll go to you next. What's your perception on the current state of workforce development? within the welding industries and again what are some of the successful initiatives or strategies that you found when it comes to potentially promoting that growth sure well we all know that uh, currently we're having a hard time attracting workers in all sectors of the economy that includes manufacturing and welding and one of the large problems is that through the years, there's been a perception of many of the manufacturing fields and even skilled trades fields as being very difficult work, uh, somewhat dirty and somewhat dangerous. And so during my entire career, I've tried to combat that perception by addressing most of the issues that many of the <clears throat> professionals, young professionals who might be entering the workforce uh, have uh, that are negative towards the industry. It seems that we need to be able to get to those students, as Ricky said, earlier in their lives and present the opportunities that are available in all of the skilled trades industries, manufacturing and construction. And so to promote that, those areas, many of us in professional organizations have used that professional organization to present scholarships, grants, and other initiatives to students so that it can help them develop their educational and training strategies uh, towards the future. Uh, the American Wellness Society gave about $2.8 million worth of grants and scholarships last year. And certainly for my own students, uh, Pell Grants are a very valuable part of their educational uh, payment system. And so both uh, a strategic alliance between government, professional organizations, and industries are needed to promote all of our industries in manufacturing and welding through the next many years. Mm -hmm. Alan, we'll wind down with you, same topics. Super, thanks. Uh, good insight from both Ricks. Thank you very much for that. Um, AMP's got a, a little bit a different perspective, I believe, or we're working right now on a different perspective. We've been at work both like ASNT and AWS working across our base, 
developing scholarship programs. We have outreach programs. We have dedicated work towards you know putting veterans to work. All those things, and and unfortunately, you know, I think we would say if we were honest about the current state, uh, we really haven't moved the needle very much, and um, we're taking a, a little bit of a different approach right now. We have some initiatives in front of our boards of directors um, that they're weighing on possibly taking a different approach to workforce development and looking at it more from an economics perspective where you're really just dealing with a supply and demand issue, right? And so all three of our organizations we see of extremely high demand for a skilled workforce or even a workforce that's willing to be upskilled, right? Um, but the supply is just not there. Uh, Rick mentioned some reasons why those perceptions exist or what things may have done to, to impact that. But I believe um, our organizations and, and the ones I've looked at and researched spend a lot of time on the supply side of that equation, trying to attract and to motivate and inspire and, and equip and upskill. And while those things are necessary, I think we've lost the demand side of it, of that equation. And so what we would like to start doing is, is, is through an ecosystem of partners like both ASNT and AWS and maybe AWWA and some, you know, some others. How do we how do we approach this from the demand side, right? And see if we can do something there that is going to really take care of the supply and attract that. So if, if we just apply the basic laws of economics, right? Um, if we can really get that demand up the supply is going to be there, right? And so that's that's kind of our approach, our our state of the union, if you will. Um, our program we have called Emerge is out doing a lot, uh, raising awareness all the way from grade schools into elementary, into to Votex schools. We provide kits for laboratory experiments. We do, I spoke to a group of teachers a couple of times this summer that are working in the, in the industry, not just us, but also with uh, welding and and non destructive testing. Um, we offering travel benefits and scholarships to people to attend our conferences or training sessions, discounting training, things like that. But really, I believe that the issue, again, with our approach and, and maybe focus on demand, is it's much bigger than AMP can ever tackle. I think it's much bigger than ASNT can tackle, and it's much bigger than AWS can tackle. Um, I think together we can probably work to, to really move that needle moving forward. All right, so let's move on to the technology side of things. And Rick, I'll start with you on this one. I'm curious what role you see technology playing when it comes to the future of workforce development, and more specifically, how have some of the recent advancements in technology impacted the welding industry, particularly when it comes to skills and training requirements? Yeah, technology is a, a big, a mover within the manufacturing industry. And so during my career, I've experienced a change from manual machining through computer numerical control machining, which uh, changed the way that machinists are trained and the number of skilled machinists that were required to make products within the United States. Same is true for welding. We've moved somewhat from manual welding into automation and robotics. However, automation and robotics has not uh, completely uh, eliminated the need for manual welders. Technology will continue to advance, and certainly it's our responsibility, both in education and industry, to provide those folks who are doing the education and training those tools and ideas about the uh, changes in technology for the future. Certainly, artificial intelligence will make somewhat of a difference within manufacturing, as there will be some um, additions to our ability to make good decisions about how welds should be made and how parts should be machined. And so there are a whole variety of those technological advances that will uh, impact the way that we provide workforce development, education and training in our schools, all the way from elementary school through our universities. It's my hope that we embrace those technological changes rather than resist those technological changes 
to improve the products and improve our ability in the United States to maintain our standard of living. Alan, I'll go to you next. What's the link as you see it between new technologies and the future of the workforce and particularly within the context of skills and training requirements? It's a great question and, and we look at those, I, I, I kind of put them in two categories. I look at the incremental and the exponential, right? So incremental, we've made advancements in surface prep. Uh, there's always those incremental technology advances that make us better at our jobs or make the jobs more efficient. And and the and then the requirement for the training in the workforce and the upskilling is is also usually just incremental. It's usually kind of a linear. Um, some of the technologies that that we're seeing uh, in the marketplace and what we're really being uh, pressed on from our members and users globally are uh, I'd say some of the key ones are the use of drones uh, for inspection and survey. Uh, but now we're actually seeing those for actual application. Uh, of different things, robotics, uh, as you know, Rick mentioned, um, seeing that really come into the workplace. Um, artificial intelligence, you know, I, that just gets probably so over talked these days, but it, it's just a force that has to be dealt with. Uh, we're seeing it really come to light in predictive analysis and predictive maintenance. Uh, and uh, I was I was actually uh, invited to go into the AI center in Saudi Aramco. In, in Riyadh, and it was absolutely just uh, in Dimam and just uh, mind blowing at the amount of data points that they're uh, being able to manage. And I know our other, you know, asset owner members are are doing the same. Um, the, another one is you know, you, they mentioned as well is additive manufacturing is as kind of this really kind of the wild wild west out there in additive manufacturing right now as it relates to the materials side of it. Um, and so we have some technical groups working on standards and trying to get out in front of that. But all of those will have direct impact exponentially on the workforce of having uh, different levels of skill sets. You'll still have to have, in our scenario, right, the blasters and the painters, and they'll still have to operate a lot of that manual equipment. But uh, when you get to the inspection level, right, that's going to change dramatically, and the need for computer sciences and and more analytical skills might come into play. And then the ability to maintain and service all of those robotics um, and the and the new machinery that's coming into play through drones, so operators, maintenance, all that stuff, uh, definitely is going to have an exponential impact. And and I think that we have to ask that question uh, as we do go out there and focus on workforce and and the really really want to know what are, what are our associations offering them to prepare them to do those things right that uh, they maybe don't find in a votech or they're not going to find in a, in a four-year degree program or in in their employer level training two other ones we're seeing emerge that have a dramatic impact on us uh, is hydrogen and carbon capture so understanding the the absolute destructive nature of both of those uh, elements, right? Uh, how you transport, how you store, how you safely manage those compounds, that's going to have a real big piece uh, uh, of influence on our workforce going forward as well. Ricky, we can wind down this topic with you. How do you see it from a non-destructive testing perspective? Sure. Um, Rick and Alan have really hit really a lot of the high points. I mean, NDT follows kind of not necessarily in lockstep, but follows a lot along with any kind of manufacturing or welding or any kind of fabrication. We have to stay in step with what type of materials they're using and what type of flaws are critical. And so um, I basically I basically got started in NDT back in, uh, in NDT 2.0, I guess. And now we're moving towards NDT 4.0 and we're, we're fully digitized. I, I see a lot of automation in our inspections, a lot of uh, identifications of, of flaws that maybe we can uh, sort flaws and make it quicker, but it's still going to rely a lot on hands-on involvement and human interaction to make uh, some of the, some of the decisions. But I see like cobots and some of the other things they're talking about. But I think a lot of this newer technology we're embracing or, and should embrace will help hopefully help bring in some of the younger generation as well, because this is right along with they are uh, have been lear weren't learning since they were born. And this is a, a good way to get them embraced as well. It's just awesome the technology is making so, so our decisions so much better with the data that we were able to able to attain now. And it, it helps across the board for safety and 
it just makes greater impact, I think. Absolutely. I want to shift our focus to diversity and inclusion because one way that I think everyone across the board can address any workforce development challenge is to broaden the potential pool of applicants and prospective employees for the future. And Alan, I'll start with you on this because I know in the last couple of years, AMP has actually introduced a new uh, diversity and inclusion grant. Just generally speaking, what are your thoughts on the importance of diversity and inclusion in our fields in this industry? And what are some of the steps or initiatives that you've seen or taken to promote diversity in the workforce? So uh, it's uh, been, at least the research that I've been privy to, it's been scientifically proven that a diverse workforce is a more um, uh, higher performing workforce. Uh, whenever you have uh, opinions and influence from different backgrounds, different cultures, different mindsets, different levels of education, different genders, um, you, you have a much richer pool of, of opportunity and ideas to work from. AMP is, is doing some really remarkable things there that I'm, I'm super supportive of, um, but we've got a long way to go, Ben. We, um, my first day on the job, I actually got to to read our DEI report, um, and maybe if if we want to, we can make that available to listeners through a link or something, um, and maybe check internally with the comms teams. Um, we have uh, in in the in the most recent survey that we did, and we we had an outside firm do that for us. Uh, we have a our our just our gender diversity inside of the materials science space is nine percent female. Mm. That is. There is zero diversity in that, right? So we've got a. Uh, they they always they say that the first you know step to a solution is admitting there's a problem, right? We definitely have a a problem to overcome, and it's maybe not one that's been created, or maybe it's one that's evolved. Um, the, how we got here is is not as important as how we move forward, and so we have put in place we have uh, a special task force around dei we have done the the research to give us some good foundation data points to work from on how we can get that message out the good news that we are seeing in that nine percent of our female population they're higher they're, they're more educated uh they're younger and those are two great data points right to, to that shows a bright future so we have to work very hard and very diligently. Again, it goes back to that supply and demand, right? We've got to create a demand that they, the supply is going to want to move towards. Uh, we have to create a work environment and opportunities that reach across cultures, religions, genders, races, all of that, um, and, and be a place where people want to, to really come and, and be a part of. And, um, we're we're on the path to doing that. I'm I'm very proud of our team for what they have done, and I think they would all agree that that we we being AMP have have a long way to go in that field. Ricky, do you want to take that from a non-destructive testing perspective as far as uh, the importance of diversity and inclusion there, and any steps or initiatives that you've seen or taken to promote diversity within that workforce? Well, sure. This is Ricky. Um, yeah, I think. I think it's it's coming along it's coming a long long way but we, we took a long time to get to the get to the, the task i think we started being more involved with it uh, we started our first uh, women in ndt uh, group around 2015 and um, some numbers that were kind of interesting we were around four percent up until about 2012 uh, for females in the in the industry and then from like when we started the women's in NDT group, we, we actually grew about 2% since 2016 to 2022, which is we hadn't had any moves like since 1998 to 2012. So we are making some small moves and we've actually we actually made the the women's group is now is going moving in towards what we're going to call IDEA, which is um, inclusion, diversity, equity and uh, access uh, to make it actually a little bit broader, but uh, I see the workforce with diversity. It, it's definitely he said scientifically proven. I have personal knowledge. It just works better when you have more diverse. I think when you have everybody with the same opinions and the same people, you end up more with the Lord of the Flies than you do with a a good working group. 
But yep. um, I think some of our outreach is, is starting to make some good effect. We had it over, I think, over 80 people attending the, the uh, IDEA meeting this past fall. So it's it's grown from a, a small group of 20 or a few people, but over 80 in attendance. So it, I'm seeing a, a good move forward, but uh, I'm hoping to continue that as well. Yep. Rick, we'll finish this discussion with you. And I find your perspective particularly noteworthy because you wear a number of hats. Obviously, you have your stint with AWS as a recent president. You've got industry experience. You've got university experience. So you see this from a number of angles. What's your perspective on DEI initiatives as it pertains to welding and what the future needs to look like? Well, certainly, as Alan and Ricky mentioned, having a number of different perspectives working on a single problem is very, very important. And I think we've made some progress in welding towards some inclusion and diversity. However, during my many years of being an instructor and being part of the American Welding Society, I think the statistics tell us that during my early years as a uh, teacher, there were about 3% female within the workforce for welding. And now there's about 6%. So although we have made some progress, we haven't made great progress. If we look at engineering fields, there were about 11% back when I started my career. And there are about 18% engineers currently. And so we haven't made great strides in engineering as well. I think part of it goes back, as I mentioned very early, to our ability to attract those students when they are very young to provide them with role models and understanding of what the industry is about. I think the key to all of this is to be able to involve the parents, to have them understand what the different types of careers are within our industries. And I don't think there is a very good understanding by parents about the opportunities that are found within our industry. The American Welding Society, like the other societies, have a a diversity and inclusion committee that tries to address diversity and inclusion. And we have a careers in welding trailer that goes around the country to promote welding by showing students and um, other people who are interested in learning about the welding area, uh, virtual welders. We also have a non-destructive testing display within that trailer. Last year, there was about 140,000 people who toured that trailer and received uh, some opportunity to understand what welding and non-destructive testing is about. I think that in addition, many of the colleges and universities that I work with have a variety of workshops for women and minorities to teach them about manufacturing areas our my college has a women in welding um, weekend uh, each spring and my current uh, enrollment with folks that are women and minorities is probably about 12 percent of the total population um, even though the population within central illinois has probably a slightly lower demographic percentage we still have been pretty able to attract those folks into the welding and manufacturing areas. And I think that that's, uh, that's the key to workforce development as well as diversity and inclusion. Get the folks early and try to teach them about the opportunities that are found in the manufacturing areas. I want to transition our discussion to career journeys, but I do want to circle back, Rick, to something you said early in your previous answer about the importance of role models. Because even though entering 2024, the needs of a relative newcomer to the field are certainly different than 10, 20 years ago, there are some constants as well, things that applied when you all were first getting started down your career path that are still potentially useful skills today to someone that may be considering entering your field. So I want to ask each of you about a key lesson or turning point that influenced your own career path that might be of value to a newcomer today. Rick, we'll start with you. If someone is looking to Rick Palanin 
recent president of the American Welding Society, and with all the credentials you laid out earlier from a wildly successful career, what's a key lesson or turning point that you had that perhaps might be useful to someone else down the road? Well, that was pretty easy. Um, my father was a mechanical engineer, and mm. during my entire years of growing up, he and I would try to figure out how things work. And my entire career has been based in the manufacturing area, trying to figure out how to either make things or make things work. But I think my journey into welding started just after I got out of high school and I needed a job. And I went to a company that built bridges. And my job was uh, very diverse at that uh, location. I was a welder. I worked as a NDT technician. I operated a crane did a variety of other types of jobs within that organization that allowed me to kind of understand what manufacturing was about. And from there, I uh, began my education career and continued to go to school through a, a bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. Ricky, same question to you. Is there a key lesson or turning point that helped shape what ultimately became a very successful career for you? Um, I, yeah, I think so. I think the thing that um, probably, actually, it seems a lot like Rick's. Actually, I, I grew up on the farm, kind of was doing welding as a young kid, repairing things enough to make it work and make things work on the farm. I remember a particular moment with my dad that somehow someone had broken a tractor in half and we ended up welding it back together and he ended up selling it and reselling it. That is, it was just amazing. I didn't know how we could even do that, but he did that. And I had a lot of the same early growing up. But the turning career part of my career was early on when I first, um, my first mentor. I think mentoring is probably the best thing. I, I think if you can't find a mentor, you haven't been looking because I think I, I think I get mentored from virtually every person I meet in this industry. But the very first person was uh, was Ronald Nisbet. He was a, a Scotsman who came over in the 60s. Early on was one of the pioneers in ultrasonics and in the marine industry. And um, I just saw the passion he had within the industry. And it, it just made it really simple for me to um, want this, I, I felt like I belonged and I felt like I was contributing to the safety of the world at the time. So it was, it was a really good turning point for me. Alan, same to you. I would give a little bit of a different perspective. My, my career track uh, looks more closely like someone hit a golf ball in a tile bathroom, right? That's kind of <laughs> what mine uh, resembles. So um, the, the point, and I, and I've, share this with my own children and others. I've, I've taken like key five key lessons in a way that I think would you know work. And that's that you have to you have to prepare. Um, you've got to prepare yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, your health, all that goes into the next part. And that's being open to opportunity. Right. So I'm a very opportunity driven person. I didn't set out to say I'm going to be a, you know, 40 year veteran in this space and and my track was much different in that I would do my best to prepare. And then as I saw an opportunity come, I would take that opportunity and I would make the most of that opportunity until it played out. And then I would, I would make the next one. That takes a little bit of being willing to take a risk, which is the third point, right? I think you got to prepare and you've got to be open to opportunities and you got to be willing to take a risk uh, when those come along. Those can be calculated risk. You know, those can be wild. Yeah, you know, uh, it's up to the individual, right? And, and what mm -hmm. the return is going to be there. But I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't take the risk of opening up the metal finishing and coating company. I wouldn't have taken. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't take the risk of uh, going into the U.S. And U.S. Coast Guard and doing law enforcement. And so all of those things have had you know tremendous influence uh, on my on my career uh, and my success. I love that. You mentioned the part, Ricky, about mentoring. Mentoring, I think, gets really uh, homogenized and diluted. And the way I approach mentoring is it's up to the protege. <laughs> so you said you've got to look for those mentors, right? Yep. And you look for mentors in specific areas. Not people think, oh, that's all a mentor, right? And they, you know, I've got, I may at one time have six different people mentoring me. Some may be mentoring me on personal finance, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I may not. They may not touch any other part of my life. I may, one may be uh, spiritually influencing me, right? But I don't seek financial advice from them. So not only a mentoring-protege relationship being important, but being specific about it. 
and understanding what it is that you're you're trying to to receive from that. And then the fifth thing is just that being that mentor and giving back, right? I think it's mm-hmm. um, I always take on the position that these people who've come along in my life, because none of us get to where we are by ourselves. I hate that phrase, you know, self-made man or self-made woman. That's the most ridiculous phrase in, in the human language. There's no such thing as a self-made anything um, other than other than like, a, you know, the other way, right? You could be a self-made <laughs> watch out or you could be a self-made <laughs> Uh, the opposite direction, but success always comes from help of others. And I think it's incumbent upon at least me, my personal belief is that I should give that back uh, in ways that I can, uh, like both the other uh, Ricks have have mentioned, either through teaching, through mentoring, through volunteering, um, even through your work, right? It's it's part of what we do. So those are my five quick points on that may help someone. Appreciate that. I think it should. I mean, the perspective on you can be a self-made failure, but not necessarily a self-made <laughs> yeah. success story is a unique, yeah, but a, like a good point from my experience. I do too. Yeah, one of my mentors used to always tell me, you know, you're always just one bad decision away from <laughs> ruining everything, yeah. right? And and so you can do that on your own. Yeah. Easily. <laughs> you can be a self-made failure, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so last discussion topic that I'm going to try to bring everything together as we wind down our panel discussion, and that's about common challenges and solutions. Ricky, we'll start with you from a non-destructive testing perspective. What are some of the more common challenges that you see individuals face when they're entering the industry, and how can those challenges be overcome? Are there any innovative solutions or approaches that you've seen that might address some of those challenges? I I think one of the better things that we can do uh, for our challenges is with at least in NDT is we have this area where we we need X amount of hours for training and then we need X amount of hours for experience and then you are able to be certified. Um, What happens is everybody seems to be very can very easily get the training, but um, getting the experience and getting hired on has has been a, a problem because after once we went from the analog age to the digital age, we lost uh, the use of level ones pretty much in our industry. Level ones were usually the assistant, the helper. And once we had digital, we had recording data and stuff. People didn't want to pay for the level one to be out there. They wanted to just pay for the level two. They did the work and he could record and do the report all by himself. Um, so we've lost that. And um, at AST, we we're starting to start to work more with this apprenticeship type program so that we can get the experience after they get the training. And we're starting to work along with um, companies within the industry and service companies to get the buy in from them as well so they can get the experience. So we're trying to create a, a smoother path, career path into the industry. I think that's one of the biggest things that we're doing currently right now that's, that's just starting to take effect. But uh, hopefully, we'll see some results from that. Rick, same question to you from a welding perspective? I think one of our biggest problems is that for a person who completes some sort of welding training, there is not a clear career path to a higher level job. And so certainly in engineering, there's a simple career path because you have to take a certain number of and uh, types of courses to complete an engineering degree or a, or a manufacturing or welding technology degree, but those folks who are welders don't really have that clear career path to head up to a job that they might choose as perhaps is a little bit better. Uh, I'm not saying that those folks who are welders are unhappy about the jobs that they're doing, but the ability to improve and the ability to move up within an organization becomes very difficult because of the way the career paths are laid out. Now, I think that in many of the uh, colleges and uh, technical schools that have welding within their curriculum, there is some career guidance that's available to those um, students who are looking to work as welders for a while and then move into some other areas. And so, as Ricky mentioned, to become an ASNT certified level one, two, or three, it becomes really difficult because the the person has to be hired by a company and get a certain number of employment hours. 
the welding inspector, certified welding inspector from the AWS, has an opportunity to take a certification test after they meet the specific criteria. But that really doesn't make them a very good inspector because they perhaps don't have the amount of time on the job to provide uh, them with the opportunity to understand the entire area. So uh, the AWS, uh, just like the AST, is investigating some apprenticeship programs for welding inspectors. We are investigating apprenticeship programs for welders. We have certification programs for welders as well as inspectors and educators. But I think one of the solutions to the problem is to ensure that our professional uh, instructors, those folks who are actually teaching people who are entering the industry have the most current information about both technology, teaching methods, and career paths. And by providing them with the appropriate information and getting them to the point where they understand what those opportunities are, as well as the way to get to some different levels, I think is very important to the health of the industry. Absolutely. Mm, Alan, well, We'll finish with you. What are some of the common challenges that you see when individuals are entering our industry? And what are some of the innovative solutions or approaches that might work when it comes to potentially overcoming those challenges? Sure. Um, and you know, this 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 may be an unpleasant answer uh, for some of the listeners, but uh, if anyone who knows me knows I, I always like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? There's no point in uh, dancing around issues when we know they're there. So I'll go back to the research. So this is not even my answer. This is the this is the scientific research that we did in our DEI study. And so just focusing on so maybe uh, uh, you know approaching a couple of these topics at once. So when we were when we were surveying the the females in the in the sector and those that wanted to come into the sector, we've so we've got 22 percent state a lack of employer financial support in their career trajectory. 19% mm. said lack of employer support for time to participate in training or extra. So you've got almost 40% of the reason of, wow. of a challenge around, around some of these career tracks career is the employer. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was mentioning earlier That's about funny. when we have to focus on the demand side, right? It just as much as we do the supply side, our employers have got to face some some challenges themselves and say, are we creating an environment that allows someone to advance in this career track? Are we supporting people advancing in this career track? Or are we putting the burden back on them? And, and our, our research has shown that in the female category, 40% of them do not feel they have employer support. So obviously that is a that is an exponential challenge that we want to work with our asset owners and employers uh, across AMP and helping them to uh, create those environments that, that do, I think, from an association from standpoint, an we've got to be able to deliver just-in-time uh, training and, and, and relevant programming. We are operating, like the other organizations, a lot of our hallmark programs are fairly dated, right? Uh, they've, they've been around for a long time and they've served the industry well. We have to be willing to look at those and say, are they still meeting the needs of an individual's career path to be able to advance? And are, are we are we an impediment there, right? Are we maybe putting too many hour requirements on something when we know that's just a non-feasible, you know, requirement to put on someone? What we what we find is a lot of those what I would call self-inflicted requirements, whether it be certifications, hours in the field, hands-on experience, things of that nature. Um, and I'm talking about things that are not like, you know, safety critical roles, right? Th these are some other ones that maybe have some flexibility in there that those are proven to not make a better employee. And, it, and just because you've got 100 hours or 200 hours or 10,000 hours on the job doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. you're you're great there. So I think uh, us reevaluating some of those things and being willing to adapt and be flexible um, is, is also very important. And then just making sure our models are up to date, right? That uh, the models that we put in place are in keeping with what we just talked about, things like carbon capture and hydrogen and, you know, dealing with drones and AI. You know, are we, are we really preparing a workforce around those 
And do we have relevant content programs, services and offerings to help in a career move along those lines? And we have to get to work. We being AMP, I, we've got a lot of catch up to do in some of those areas for sure. All right, that will do it for today's panel discussion. I want to thank all of our guests, Alan Thomas, CEO of AMP, Rick Polanin, past president of the American Welding Society, and Ricky Morgan, past president with the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing. Again, appreciate all of them for their time. And if you want more resources or to get in touch with any of these associations to learn about their initiatives or perhaps to provide feedback, the best way to do that is online. You can access AMP at ampp.org, the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing at asnt.org, and the American Welding Society at aws.org. That will do it for today. For Alan, Rick, and Ricky, I'm Ben Dubose, news editor with the AMP Publications team. Thank you all so much for listening, and please come back soon for another new AMP podcast.